I have a ranch, I have a tennis court, I have a bowling alley in my house. I mean, I live in a mansion. Okay. Now, there's Bill Gates' house. <laughs> so, here, Bill Gates has all these things. Let's, and then, what you want to do is be friends with his children so that you can play in his house. So you're trying to do your best to butter them up, and then you know they eventually accept you, and you get to go to his house and, and do all those things. Okay, get to enjoy the house. Most people become Christians because they want to go to heaven. They want to have a relationship, friendship with Jesus, so that they can go to his house. They don't care about him. They just want his house. I don't want you to be my friend because you want to use my house. I want you to be my friend because I'm interesting to you. You want to get to know me. And we want to do things together. We want to relate to each other. See, if you became a Christian because you wanted to avoid hell and go to heaven, that's bypassing the relationship. It's like saying, Dad, I just want your money. I just want your car. I just want your computer. That's all I want. Oh, I want to enjoy your house too. Yeah, that. But I don't want to have anything to do with you. Is, is that the way it is? Well, Christians do that. They, they want to go to heaven. No. It says, enter the kingdom of heaven. You know what the kingdom of heaven is? It's not a place. It's a relationship. And if you want to enter into a relationship with Jesus, then you have to trust. Remember, it says, God, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know what everlasting life is? It's not longevity of life. It's not how long you live. Don't misunderstand the kingdom of heaven and everlasting life as a place or a time. See, because Jesus defined eternal life, and he says in John chapter 17, verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the Heavenly Father, and me, the one you sent. That's eternal life. Eternal life is our relationship with Jesus. He's not saying anything different than here, there, everywhere in Scripture. You just want to use his house? That's a crying shame. You just want to go to heaven? What a missed opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus. And if you have that mentality, you're going to come up with credentials why he needs to accept you. And if you do, he's going to totally reject you. When we share the gospel, don't mention heaven. Kingdom of heaven, yeah. We know what that is. Don't mention heaven. If you if you want or if you want salvation, and we say, and you know, you can you can die and then go to heaven if you if you accept Jesus as your Savior. That's I, I want to start shifting because we, in Christendom, have made the gospel so simple, and it is, but we made it so simple just to get people into heaven because we care so much that we lost the whole purpose of why Jesus came in the first place. It's not to just save us so that we can go on our merry way. Christianity is not the end. It's the beginning. If you think, oh, now that I'm going to heaven because I accepted Jesus as my Savior and I'm done, you missed the point. Is that what your parents did? Oh, I gave them birth. I'm done. <laughs> no, that's only the beginning. The beginning of the relationship that continues on throughout eternity. I'm going to 
give you an illustration. You don't know what you're required to do, but you're going to have to exercise faith, okay? Uh, even though this is a $5 bill, it's really a <coughs> deposit, okay? So, and what I mean by that is, I, I really wanted 20 but I didn't have 20 so the next time I see you and you actually win this, okay, I trade it in for a 20 So keep this until next time I come here and I'll give you a 20 in replacement of this, okay? I just want the value to be significant. You know, $5, you can yeah, that's nothing. But $20 is a little more significant. And that's a lot of Chipotle. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of Chipotle, okay? So, this is what I want you to do, okay? And I'm going to give everybody a fair shake. So, once I tell you what you need to do in order to win this, then you can do it. And after that, I'll tell you what you need to do so that the actions are actually challenging to you and you're actually implemented. Okay? In other words, I'm going to give you this if you promise to do something. Okay? But in order to win this and find out what that is, you have to do this. Okay? So, the first person who does this gets this. And then I'll tell you what you need to do. Alright? And follow up to that. Okay? There you go. Are you ready? Alright. The first person who says, stands up and says, whatever it is, I'll do. We'll get this. And trade it in for a 20 next time. So you have to say, you have to stand up and say, whatever it is, I'll do. Any takers? You don't want 20? Nobody? This is rare. Okay. So, whatever it is, I'll do. That's all you have to do to say when you stand up. Anybody? Come on. Come on. Somebody? Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, because I'm, I'm accountable, right? Because you can always replay the tape and say, yes, he said that, you're accountable, you need to give me that money. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to put you in two categories, as I said. There are those who believed and those who didn't. That's all. It doesn't matter what you're not sure, you know, no. A any other category besides I believed means I didn't. No matter what. When you believe, you do something about it. She's the only one in my mind who believed. And only one in our minds who believed. Because she was the only one who did something about it. How do we know you believe? You're just sitting there. How do you know you believe? You were just sitting there. You have no idea. You have absolutely no idea whether you believe it or not because you didn't do anything about it. You're not sure of yourself. See, the requirement of faith is if you believe, you do something about it. Otherwise, how would you know? How would anybody know? It took an element of faith because she didn't know what she had to do. I, I just said, go shoot somebody. <laughs> you go, uh oh. <laughs> I didn't sign up for that. Okay? Took an element of faith. I didn't want to I didn't want to go there. I didn't want anything to be evil. But this is normal Christianity that we share our faith, right? I'm not asking her to do anything that the Lord is not asking of us. But what is faith? Faith is We have to trust Jesus by living and resting in Him. That never stops once we start a relationship with the Lord. We're constantly challenged to trust Him. The very first sin was a sin of a lack of trust. In the garden was a lack of trust. Satan said, hey, you're not going to die you're not going to die because you'll be like God, knowing good and evil when you eat this. So Adam and Eve, they didn't trust God that what he said was going to come to pass. They did it anyway. It was a lack of trust. See, who here prayed to become a Christian? You know, you say, oh, I want to be a Christian, and then you sat there, and you, whoever prayed with you, or you prayed to receive Christ. So, they said, who? Okay? Only, only, are, are you all believers? No? Yes? Maybe? I don't know? Well, if you don't know, you're not a believer. Okay? Let's just get that straight right now. Okay. So, some of you, four, five, six of you, prayed to become a Christian. Well, guess what? You didn't become a Christian because you prayed. No. As a matter of fact, show me a single passage in Scripture where somebody prayed to become a Christian. Doesn't exist. Not a single passage. Yet all these people became Christians. Ha! Huh? They just believed. They just trusted. So it's not the prayer that saves you, it's the faith that precedes the prayer that already saves you. When you pray, you're just demonstrating it. And you don't have to pray to become a Christian. I, would, I became a Christian just like that. I didn't pray. I just trusted that this was real and that Jesus actually did die for me and that I needed to embrace him in order to have a relationship with him. And I started praying because I wanted to seek him and understand his mind. So, I want to unravel for you and dismiss some of your assumptions about what it means to be a Christian according to the text. There was an illustration, oh, there was a, a program, uh, it was Nightline, and Ted Collins.
couple was, was the interviewer. Way back, it was like when I was younger, like in my 20s, 30s, maybe. Yeah. I'm, I'm in my 40s now, I'm about, about, I'm about to be 50 in May. Right? Still, you know, just bubbly and, and with energy and athletic, I play sports, I want to play some volleyball today, but I don't know how, you know, depending on my, on my cold. Uh, but Ted Couple was, was interviewing, his name is uh, Jerry Jenkins, and he was the co-author of the Left Behind series. Christian. Okay. And here was the question that Ted Couple asked. He said, hey, Christians who don't live good lives go to heaven, but non-Christians who live better lives, they don't. And that was the question. And I was so disappointed with the answer that he gave. It was just so frustrating because he said, well, I believe that God knows what he is doing and that he will do what is just. Here you had the opportunity of a lifetime to tell the world how it is and he fell short. See? Why? Because, he, let's say there was a, a loyal employee for 30 years of your company, right? This employee was loyal, came and stayed late and never missed, you know, never called in sick, uh, had personal time, but anyway, he was very loyal. 30 years he gave the company, right? Your child was a womanizer, he was erratic, didn't finish college, and he was just a mess. Everybody was saying, hey, what is wrong with your son? <laughs> okay. Now, it's time for you to die and leave your company. Are you going to leave your company to the 30-year loyal employee or your son? I tell you, it's an easy answer. You're going to leave it to your son. It doesn't matter how bad or awful he is. Inheritance is based on a relationship. See? So, non-Christians, okay, they may not be perfect. They might not get it all right on earth. And somebody like Mother Teresa, if she was a believer, and I believe she was, but even if she wasn't, she shouldn't get what you should get because you have the relationship with the Lord. Now, just because you have the relationship, you better be an exemplary godly citizen of the kingdom. But even if you weren't, it's the relationship that guides what you get and what you don't get. Your question and my question is not whether I'm doing the right thing and I'm practicing Christianity and I'm saying the right thing and I'm speaking Christianese. You and I have to figure out whether we have a relationship with the Lord or not. Because that is the key. And that's where the crux is. Because if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, you're excluded. But if you have a relationship with the Lord, you don't have anything to worry about. I ask again, are you Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you don't allow us to play games with you. Because you give us scripture so that we can know and we can evaluate ourselves and we can determine what criteria you use in order to determine whether we have a relationship with you or not. And Father, what a tragedy it would be if we assumed all of our lives that we had a relationship with you by the wrong criteria, by the wrong definition, and then when we stand in front of you face to face, we end up with people like these who try to pull up credentials and reject and dismiss the relationship aspect. And we pray that that would not be the tragedy that we face, and that you would draw our hearts to you so that we can walk with you and 
treat you like our Heavenly Father if we really do have a relationship. And that if not, then we would exercise because you enable us the trust that we need to exercise in order to start a relationship with you by being adopted into your family. And we can truly call you our Heavenly Father because we have a relationship with you 